Well, good morning, church. What a blessing to be here today. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, this church is a real blessing. Uh, I was actually last year, as Ryan said, before, before the uh, lockdown. So it was around February 2020. And uh, just, just blessed to be here this morning with the body of Christ. Uh, with all of our blemishes and peculiarities. If I can pronounce that word. Uh, we're a blessed people, aren't we? Amen. Amen. We're blessed to be here. And of course... The most important one that's here is the Lord Jesus Christ by His Spirit. And I just had on my heart this morning that, uh, you know, the Lord has some uh, breakthroughs for us this morning. Just while I was praying this morning, you may be going through a tough time financially, mentally, with your health, relationships, but the Lord can make a way for you if you will believe and not doubt. Isn't that good? And we're going to be talking about some of those things this morning. But uh, he's a good, good father. All the time. I said all the time. And that includes today and that includes the season of life that we're in right now. And uh, so as Ryan mentioned, my name's Andrew Oliver. Grew up in Australia, uh, excuse me, grew up and raised in New Zealand. <laughs> and uh, came over here 2002. Uh, did an exercise science, studied in, the, in, in that area. Then I went to Bible school in 2013 and the Lord placed missions on my heart. So I've actually done five years missions work in Latin America. Anyone here from Latin America? No, not today. Uh, but uh, that was uh, just a, a blessed time and the Lord really put on my heart to teach people uh, who they are in Christ and to over the overcoming life that's available to us in Christ Jesus. You know, the scripture says, whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And that includes all the trials that are involved in the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So I uh, named my newsletter, The Overcomer. And uh, back in September of 2020, the Lord placed on my heart to spend more time here in Australia. Not surprisingly, because he knew COVID was coming and the travel restrictions were coming. So uh, it's a blessing to be teaching and doing more work here in Australia. And as Pastor Bernie said, praying for revival. Welcome to those joining online as well. I believe the Holy Spirit can minister to you right there where you're watching this. Let's just have a word of prayer and we'll get into the word. Father, we thank you for your presence here today. Lord Jesus, you are the Lord, head of the church. And we ask you to minister to us today, Father, by your spirit. We open up our hearts to hear from heaven. We open up our ears to, to hear, our eyes to see, Lord, more of you today. We ask, Lord, for your power to be manifest here today. And I ask you to visit the people in a special way here today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if you could go with me, please, to the book of James. The epistle of James. James chapter 1. Morning, John. James chapter 1, verse 1. It says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete lacking nothing in february of this year i took a few days off uh, to go down to springbrook mountain I've got a little what i call a prayer cabin down there i just rent it out and and use it for a time to spend quality time with the lord and i was down there having three days of 
prayer and fasting, seeking the Lord. And during that time, the Lord placed on my heart the power of joy, rejoicing, and praising God as we pass through tests and trials. And I went into that prayer time, I wouldn't say extremely joyful, <laughs> probably the opposite. But the Lord began to teach me along these lines, and he led me right here to the book of James. And uh, the epistle of James, it's an interesting letter because it was written during a time of great persecution against the church where their faith was being tried. Many theologians believe this epistle was written shortly after the church was scattered from Jerusalem in Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, verse 1, it says, At that time a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. So if we put ourselves back in that time, if we put ourselves in their shoes... You'd remember that Saul of Tarsus had risen up. He was on the rampage. He was persecuting Christians, locking Christians up, even killing some of them. He was there consenting to the stoning of Stephen. Remember that? In Acts chapter 7. And many believers would have been uprooted from their homes during this time. They would have lost property, possessions. They would have been uprooted from one city from one town to another. And I imagine many of them were thinking, where's the Lord in all this? I mean, has he forgotten his people? Has he disappeared? Don't we serve the Most High God? Then why are we being scattered? And these are questions that are being asked today, are they not? And these are questions that come up when we're faced with a severe trial, particularly a trial that really blindsides you. You didn't see it was coming and it just hits you. And uh, these, these are questions that come up in your mind. The Lord wants to help us along these lines this morning. And uh, don't be discouraged. This is an encouraging message today. You're going to be... You're going to be joyful by the end of it, if, if you're not already. So verse 2, let's look at it again. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing. I mean, take note of that word, underline it, do whatever you have to do. Knowing. So you're, you're rejoicing knowing something. You're rejoicing knowing that the testing of your faith is producing patience. Now, there are two different types of knowledge. There's sense knowledge, and then there's revelation knowledge. Now, sense knowledge comes through our five physical senses. How do I know there's a podium right here? Well, I know it's here because I can see it with my eyes. I can touch it, I can feel it. If I knock on it, I can hear the, hear the sound of that. So my five physical senses, right, they tell me there's a podium right here. So that's one form of knowledge. But then there's another form of knowledge called revelation knowledge. And that is an inner knowing that comes to our heart through the Holy Spirit, and through the Scriptures. Let me give you an example. How do you know you're a child of God? How do you know you're going to heaven when you die? You haven't seen heaven, huh? How do you know you have peace with God? And that's why that can be so hard to explain to an unbeliever. They say, well, how do you know you're going to heaven? And you say, well... I know that I know. I mean, I, I know deep down in here, I know. Our joy is based on revelation knowledge 
of who our God is. You see, we can rejoice even in the midst of the trial knowing that our Father is a faithful God who keeps covenant. The scripture says he keeps covenant to a thousand generations. We can rejoice knowing that he's faithful to fulfill his promises in our lives. We can rejoice in the trial knowing he specializes in delivering his people. Do you know that? God, God's speciality, if you like, is delivering his people. And even when all hope appears lost, he can turn it around. He can make a way. Do you know one of the names of, the, of God is the Lord of the breakthrough? Or the Lord of the breaking through? That's the Lord. And Jesus said, I am the way, the, the, the way, the truth and the life. In other words, our God can make a way when sense knowledge says there is no way. Now think about the Israelite people. They had an Egyptian army behind them. They had a Red Sea in front of them. I mean, their senses told them there's no way. We're stuck. We're done for. There's no way out of this. But God said, ah, I have a way. Yeah, yeah, I have a way. You just can't see it. And you know, the scripture says his way was in the sea. God said, yeah, I've got, got a road for you to walk on. Where's the road, Lord? It's right through the sea. Ah, uh, God, we, we, we can't walk through seas. <laughs> You will today. <laughs> and God just folded back the seas. And there's a wall of water on this side. There's a wall of water on that side. And they passed. Imagine that, huh? They walked. Why? Because God made a way. Mm. Now, different time we're living in, right? Different trials but same God. Not some different God, same God. Huh? Do you read your Bible? That's why we need to read the Bible. We see the history of our God and, and the God will show, uh, excuse me, the Bible will show the Lord, our God, delivering his people from impossible looking situations again and again and again and again. So we can and should rejoice by faith in who He is. We rejoice by faith knowing who He is. Knowing His promises, you see. The scripture says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. all. Aren't you pleased it doesn't say 85% of them? Because if it said 85% of them, you'd always have that question, you know, no, maybe I'm the one here. <laughs> I got the unlucky ticket. Sure feels like it. Sure looks like it. But no, he delivers you and me out of them all. But for those who believe, who trust in him, we're going to talk about that. So verse 4, let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Wow. So point number two, in the midst of an outward trial, God is wanting to do an inward work in us. Hmm? Now let's deal with the meaning of patience, because most people have the idea that patience means to just put up with something. But actually, in the Bible, patience means to be constant. It means to be consistent. It means to be stable. And the greatest example of that, of course, is our Lord, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Perfectly constant. 
He's not up one day, down the next. He's not in faith one day, in fear the next. He's perfectly constant. So is your heavenly Father. He is the God who heals you. I mean, He was the God who heals you. He is the God who heals you. He will forever be the God who heals you because that's His name. He's the Lord God, your provider. He's the Lord God, your shepherd, for this, from this day forth and forevermore. And you know, the shepherd guides the sheep. The shepherd protects the sheep. The shepherd uh, provides, protects, and guides the sheep. Are you his sheep? Amen. And we have a good, good shepherd. So the trial is uncomfortable, but it does provide us an opportunity to grow and develop for the Lord to clear out some junk. But let patience have its perfect work in you that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Notice that phrase there. So the Lord has a higher place for us on the other side of the trial if we will lock into his faithfulness and into his promise. There's actual, actually promotion and increase for us on the other side of the trial. And that's one reason the devil's coming against us. He's trying and coming against you. He's trying to stop that increase. He's trying to stop that promotion from coming to pass. Now let me give you an example here. If I said to you today, you have to walk from here to Tweed Heads and you can't catch a bus, you can't hitchhike, nothing like that. You have to walk on the side of the road all the way from here to Tweed Heads. I googled it, it's eight and a half hours. <laughs> and I said, when you get to Tweed Heads, your reward will be a Big Mac hamburger. I mean, you're going to walk down there and that's what you get for it. What are your emotions going to be while you're walking? <laughs> you're going to be discouraged. You're going to be probably frustrated, annoyed. You're going to be anything but joyful, right? You're not going to, I mean, if you're happy over that, it doesn't take much to please you. Huh? <laughs> But now let's change it up. Let's say, you're going to walk from here to Tweed Heads today, but when you get there, there'll be $200,000 waiting for you there. Well, that's a little bit different, isn't it? Huh? Uh, yeah, you're going to sign up for that? Yeah. <laughs> this is just an example, by the way. <laughs> so... You start out, you're walking to Tweed Heads, people are driving past you, they'll say, oh, look at that poor chap walking on the side of the road. I mean, he's, he's walking all that way, the poor fella. But you've got this big grin on your face from ear to ear because you know that this walk is only temporary. You've got your eyes on the prize. You know what's coming to you on the other side of that temporary pain, right? And, and what's coming to you outweighs the present suffering. Hmm? Isn't that true? So you can have joy while you're walking because really you're not focused on the sore muscles. You're seeing how you're going to spend that money. I mean, you see yourself buying whatever it is you like to buy, paying off the mortgage, huh? And so you have joy knowing. Now, we can apply that to heaven and our heavenly reward, and that, that really is the, I mean, that's the bonanza. <laughs> We're pressing down here, and I, I really believe that was a real key to the Apostle Paul's ministry. I mean, he had a revelation. See, don't forget, he went to the third heaven, and he had a revelation of his reward up there and he said, I'm exceedingly joyful in all my tribulations. Why? He saw his heavenly account just growing. 
Every soul saved, every disciple won, every demon cast out. It's just, it's growing. And he had revelation knowledge of that. And we look at him and we say, oh, the poor fellow, he's gone through this, he's shipwrecked, he's beaten and all. No, 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 he's exceedingly joyful through it all because he sees what's coming. Do you know the Bible says Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross? Why? He saw you. He saw you born again. He saw you with him in the kingdom of God. He saw, not only that, he saw himself raised up from the dead, seated at the right hand of God forevermore. And I guess he had a pretty good understanding of eternity because he was and he is. I mean, he, that's a mystery to me, but he said before, he said, I, I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven. Huh? He's been around a long time. He's God. Amen. So we can apply it to heaven, but we can also apply it to the trial you're in right now. That by faith you can see God is bringing me to a higher place. For the church corporately, God is bringing us to a higher place. And we press through and we see it and we see this glorious outpouring, and we see that higher place, and we're exceedingly joyful in all of our trials, and people are wondering, what's wrong with you? <laughs> well, you, you shouldn't be here. You shouldn't have joy. Do you know the fruit of the Spirit is supernatural? It's supernatural love. It's love when you shouldn't be loved. It's not just love to those who are kind to you. It's love to your enemies. Supernatural love. It's supernatural joy. Do you know our giving is supernatural? Our generosity. The Corinthian church, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians 8, he's writing to the Corinthian church about the Macedonian Christians, and he said, in their deep poverty, they responded with rich generosity. I mean, they were in a severe, <laughs> deep poverty, and how did they respond? with great generosity. He said they were in a severe trial and they responded with, they had an abundance of joy. Wow. I mean, they're overcoming the trial with joy. They're overcoming the poverty with generosity. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. So we can rejoice through the storm knowing He's bringing us out and he's bringing us up. Say that with me. Say, he's bringing me out and he's bringing me up. So cheer up. Not only out, but up. You know, Job, when God restored Job, he didn't just restore him one for one. He restored him double. You'll find that all through the Bible. For their shame, they'll be given double honor. Mm. I like God's accounting system, don't you? <laughs> Amen. I mean, he said 30, 60, and 100 fold. He didn't just say one for one. Now, let's talk about this kind of loyalty to the word that locks in during the storm. It's right here in James chapter 1, verse 5. Just keep reading. It says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach. That means without fault finding. And it will be given to... Now again, this is an interesting thought too. Why does James in the trial say, God will give you wisdom without fault finding? Because again, when you're in a trial, you start to thinking, you know, maybe I'm in this because God's holding my faults against me. Maybe that's why I'm in this predicament. And James is saying, no, get that out of your mind. He's not holding your faults against you. You know, in the fifth chapter, he says, if any among you is sick, let him call for the elders of the church, let them pray over him, and the prayer of faith will heal the sick, and if he's committed any sins, he'll be forgiven. I mean, he just, write, he just makes a blanket statement. He says, 
He doesn't even know the people, and he says if they've committed sins, they'll be forgiven. He doesn't know the people, but he knows the character of his God, that he's merciful. His mercy endures forever. You know, Jesus healed the multitudes. I don't know if you've ever had this thought, but how many in that multitude that he healed were sinning? And you never see Jesus come up and say, be healed, be healed. Uh, you stole a carrot yesterday. You return the carrot, then come back and be healed. Now you be healed. Uh, you, uh, <laughs> I mean, if he's going to do that, there's something wrong with the whole bunch. I mean, <laughs> every one of us. If he's holding our sins against us, none of us would get anywhere. That's what the cross of Calvary is for. Huh? It's faith in his love. It's not faith in your works. It's faith in his goodness. That even though I messed up, God knew before, the, before time that I would have messed up. He made provision for my mess up and he's still going to come through for me. He's still going to break through for me. He's still going to provide for me. Amen? That's the God we serve. He's better than you think. I mean, as good as you can think, you think of the best person you can think of, he's better than that. Amen. Mm. That's good preaching. I'm glad I came today. I needed to hear this. <laughs> but I heard it last night when I preached it to myself, so that's why I came in happy, John. <laughs> okay. So if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God. He gives liberally without reproach. It'll be given him. But let him ask in faith. That's the key issue. Uh, not your, he doesn't say major on you. He majors on where's your faith. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. What does that mean? He's driven and tossed by the circumstances. He's driven and tossed by how it looks. He's driven and tossed by how it seems. He's driven and tossed because it looks like we can make it. Oh, it doesn't look like we're going to make it. Things, it looks like things are getting better. Oh, no, it looks like things are getting worse now. So he's up and he's down. He's, he's driven around. Why? Because your sense knowledge is constantly changing. You can feel good today. You can feel bad tomorrow. You can feel well today. You can feel sick tomorrow. You can... Huh? The economy's coming back. Oh, no, the economy's not good. It's coming down. Oh, it's coming back. No, it's coming back. No, but we have something else happen over here and it's coming back down. But your economy can just keep going like this. Because heaven's economy is going like this. And he meets your needs according to what's going on here? No. He meets your needs according to his riches in glory. By Christ Jesus. Verse 7, let not that man suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. Boy, that's strong. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Now it's tempting, very tempting, to be double-minded when the winds of contrary feelings and circumstances are blowing. That's why we must purpose in our hearts to lock in by faith to the Lord's promises. You lock in by faith, you're like a bulldog. You know, a bulldog locks in and he won't let go. That's what you're like with the promise of God. You lock in and you hold on for dear life. Do you know why? Because his word is your life. He is your life. And you lock into it and you refuse to be blown off course. You know, I don't want to be unstable in all my ways. I want to be fixed. How about you? I want to be anchored. I want a purpose in my heart, or I have, to go through to the finish line, to go through the pain, to pass the tests, and to remain faithful to Jesus through it all. You know, to be an overcomer, you have to have something to come over. Now, that's uncomfortable. But, you know, Smith Wigglesworth, he said, great testimonies come out of great tests. You don't ever go through much, then you're probably not going to have too much to preach. 
but you go through it and you come through it, ah, now you've got a testimony. Now you've got a testimony. What is it? The Lord is faithful. He kept me. It looked like I was going down, but he supernaturally kept me. Can God keep you in these days? Yes. Hmm? And you have to be fully persuaded that he can and he will keep me while I'm anchored to him, while I'm anchored to his word. Now, in March of 2020, I received the news from my place of employment that I would be stood down until further notice. And I remember walking back to my car and I was feeling discouraged because I was believing for a, uh, quite a few things, but it, you know, an upgraded car, I needed a, needed a new car. I was believing for a certain amount of money for, for savings. And now when I received that news, it looked like, well, it's not going to happen. I mean, kiss that goodbye. But I remember, I mean, I remember it like it was yesterday, Pastor George, and I was sitting in my car and I heard the Lord speak on the inside of me, down in here, where he'll speak to you. And he said, has my promise changed? I thought, well, has your... I said, no, Lord. I mean, I mean, the Bible still reads the same. I mean, the, the promise hasn't changed. He said, has Mark eleven twenty four changed? I said, well, no. I mean, Mark eleven twenty four still reads the same. And the reason he brought that up to me is because that's what I based my prayer on to begin with. Mark eleven twenty four says, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Well, you see, I'd prayed and asked for the new car. I believed I'd received it, so I was thanking God for it. But now the wind's gone out of my sail because it doesn't look like it can happen now. Now you analyze that for a moment. I'm in faith while it looks good and while I'm feeling good, but when it looks bad, then I'm not in, now I'm discouraged. And so the Lord said, why are you discouraged? He said, I can still perform my word. You stay in faith. And you keep thanking and praising me for the car and for the money. And it wasn't an easy thing to do, but I had to, in that car, sitting there, I said, well, Lord, yes, I believe you. You can still perform your word. It looks impossible. I don't know how, but I just thank you that you said you'd do it. You're able to do it. And what's impossible for men is not impossible with you. So I thank you. For my car, I, and this this will work by the way for whatever it is. You know, I thank you for my healing. I thank you for my car. I thank you for that money. I have it, and I want to thank you for it. And you know, just when I did that, it was like that pleases God. I just sense it's pleasing to Him. Do you know faith pleases you? If you say to me, hey, Andrew, there's a black dog out there. And I look out the window and I think, I can't see any black dog. And I go, no, there's no black dog out there. Yeah, there's a black dog out there. No, there's no black dog out there. And you say, come over by the window. And I come right over by the window and oh, okay, there is a black dog down there. <laughs> but if you, say, if you say, there's a black dog out there, and I can't, and I go, I can't see. Okay. Okay. Pastor George said there's a black dog out there. Hey, John, there's a black dog out there. Have you seen it? No. Nope. But it's out there. That pleases him because he thinks, well, you know, he, 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 he trusted me. He believed me. That'll work well at, at the job too. The boss tells you to do something. You think, why do I got to do that? Okay, I'll go do it. And you're thinking, I don't know why we're doing this, but he said do it. He must have a reason for it. What's the worst employee? Why are we going to do that? Why are we doing that? Yeah. You've, got to tell, you've got to explain everything. They won't do it until they have sense, knowledge, and understanding. Oh, then now I'll do it. See, God is a faith God. He wants you to obey Him by faith. Huh? 
Boy, when he called me on that second mission trip, he said, go book to the States and Latin America for three months. I arrived at the airport in Los Angeles. I had a bag full of quarters <laughs> from a previous trip, and I had about $3 in my account. And I booked for three months. But in here, I knew he's going to take care of me. See, I knew I'd heard from God. And faith will work here when you have questions here. The devil will always come with questions here. How's it going to happen? You're going to starve out. And you need to be ready to come back with the word of God. I don't know how it's going to happen. I know my God is going to supply all my needs. He's my shepherd. It is written, Satan. Yeah? Well, to make a long story short, the car came in, the money came in. It looked like the sky was falling, but lo and behold, it didn't fall. Huh? See, right in that moment when that trial hits you, it looks often, you know, when you can calm down and get your emotions out of it, sometimes it's, well, it's not quite as bad as it first seemed. Huh? Or even if it is, God can work a miracle and will work a miracle for you if you believe. Now, the test the children of Israel failed was failing to rejoice and praise God as they passed through the wilderness. Instead, they grumbled, they complained, they hardened their hearts, they refused to trust in the Lord. Now, get this when it looked like they wouldn't make it. So you've got to, give, you've got to put the, yourselves in their shoes because God said, you're going to go possess that land and their eyes told them, there's giants. We're outnumbered. There's walled cities. And what they did was they sided in with what it looked like and what it seemed like instead of the promise of God except two men, Joshua and Caleb, they said, yeah, there's giants. Yeah, there's walled cities. We don't know how, but we know him. He's faithful and he, and he will give us the land. I don't know. He may just squash the giants. He may send angels. He may cause us to grow two feet taller. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure they didn't know how. He, how many of you know how God's going to do it? Most of the time, we don't know how he's going to do it. We just know he will do it. Why? Because he said he would do it. They magnified the enemy. They complained against their leaders. They said they would never make it. Now your words in a trial are massive. James goes on to talk about the tongue. They said they would never make it. They said they'd die in the wilderness. They kept saying they would die in the wilderness. And guess what? They died in the wilderness. Not because it was the will of God, because they failed to lock in to his promise. Hmm? And the book of Hebrews warns us and says, don't follow their example of unbelief. Don't you harden your heart. You trust him. You trust him when it looks like you're not going to make it. You lock in, to, and that's what James is saying right here as well. He's saying you lock in. And if you won't lock in, he's very blunt. I don't know if anyone's more blunt than James. He says if you won't lock in, you won't receive anything from the Lord. I mean, you'll go to heaven, but you're not going to receive any greater blessings from the Lord. I mean, that's about as plain as you can put it. Why, can, why does he say that? Because he knows the devil will come to tempt and to test your faith. I mean, it's going to come. Trial's going to come. Devil's going to come. And you have to be ready to stand against that with the Word of God. Putting on the full armor of God. So they should have been thanking and praising God, knowing, talking about the children of Israel, knowing that this was temporary. That soon they would be in the promised land. Now, another thing they got to do, they were complaining about the manna. You see, they said, well, you know, we're eating manna. Manna for breakfast, manna for lunch, manna for dinner. Manna Monday, manna Tuesday. All we get is this manna. 
instead of number one, thanking God they had something to eat, and number two, the manna, when we're in the promised land, we'll have a variety. We're not living in the wilderness, we're passing through the wilderness. This is temporary. But because they failed to rejoice and they failed to praise God, God just says, do another lap, you, un you ungrateful bunch. Go around again until you learn <laughs> to thank me and praise me. And guess what? They did another lap and they're still grumbling and they're still complaining. God says, do another lap. And they did 40 laps and he said, time's up. I've got to move on with the program here. <laughs> So you got this new generation raised up that wouldn't, I mean, they, they, <laughs> they learnt better than that. Huh? Now we can see it looking back at them, but can we see it with ourselves and the time we're living in? Huh? So it's easy to look back at them and say, well, they should have done that because you can see the end result. But it's harder to see it in the middle of the trial. Huh? Your vision gets blurry. Your emotions are up. But you have to say, I can't see a way, but my God is the way, and I'm holding on to him. And I mean, if I'm going down, then the God of heaven will have to be go, go, go down because I'm right next to him, I'm in him, and I'm clinging to him. So if I'm going down, almighty God's going down with me. Because <laughs> I'm clinging to his coattails. But you've got to hold on. And the devil will try to talk you out of letting go. That's the name of his game. To get you to let go of the word. To get, let, to get you to let go of your faith. Of, your, of the promise. You see, the Bible teaches us that trials are temporary. Temporary. But boy, when you're in the middle of one, it doesn't look temporary, does it? It's like this is, this is going on forever. But 1 Peter 5.10, it says, May the God of all grace who's called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Where is that coming from? That's from here. <laughs> you want me to get rid of that? That means I've got to preach for one more hour. That's what that, that's what that means. <laughs> Just 45 more minutes. That's right. <laughs> oh. Hallelujah. So because we know the trial is temporary, we, temporary and because we know God has a way out, we can and should go through the trial praising God. God rejoicing by faith, by faith, for faith shouts while the walls are up. Huh? God says, I want you to shout. I've given you the victory. Yeah, but God, the walls are up. Well, you shout and the walls will come down. No, you bring the walls down and I'll shout. No, no, no. That's like saying, fire, give me some heat and I'll put in some wood. No, no, you put in the wood. <laughs> You have to shout while the walls are still up. Oh, come on. I'm preaching better than you're shouting. You have to shout while the walls are up. You have to say, God, you're faithful. When it, I don't care what it looks like. You know, the Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. We praise him for our deliverance and for our promotion. As I said, both for us individually and then corporately for the church. He wants to bring the church to a higher place, a place of greater fruitfulness, 
power, effectiveness. We praise him for the great harvest of souls coming into the kingdom of God. Now here's a thought for you. The persecution in Acts chapter 8 was followed by the conversion of Saul in Acts chapter 9. And by the gospel going to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. And then on to the Gentile world, the missionary trips of Paul. So you talk about breakthrough and increase on the other side of the trial. Huh? Satan was trying to stop that. But he couldn't. You know, the Bible says, Paul writing to the Thessalonians, he said, we wanted to come to you, but Satan hindered us. But you know, in the very next chapter, he, he says, I'm, we're, we're praying that God will direct our steps and make a way for us to come to you. Yeah, but you just said Satan's been hindering you. Yeah, Satan's been hindering us, but he's not going to stop us. He had a persistent faith. Can you see that? He didn't just throw on the towel and say, Satan's hindered us. We can't come. Sorry, guys. Do the best you can. He said, Satan's hindered us. He's delayed, it, delayed us. He's come against us. But he's not bigger than our God. And our God has kept us, number one. And our God will make a way for us to come to you. Mm. Now, I'm trying to close. In under 45 minutes. <laughs> now, here's a quote by Smith Wigglesworth. He said, We have no idea what God wants to do for us through trials and temptations. They do two things for us. When there's anything wrong in us, which we are not recognizing, trials bring it to the surface that we may see our need of God's salvation in this respect. But why are even the most faithful of God's children tried and tempted? It is that their very faithfulness and loyalty and the purity of their faith may be made manifest and found unto praise, honor, and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Gold has to be tried by fire and it's made more precious thereby. Your faith, Peter says, is much more precious than gold that perishes. Now, why, do you try, why does gold have to be tried by fire? Well, you've got to sort out the true from the false. When you purify that silver, you've got to separate, what, the dross from the valuable. Mm. James 1.12 Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Now that word temptation in the Bible, it means tempta testing, temptations, testing and trials. It's the same Greek word. So blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life. God expects you to be approved. He expects you to pass the test, not fail it. He says, I, I, I know Dennis, he'll, he, he'll cling to my word. Even when it doesn't look like it even when it doesn't seem like it. See, he believes the best in us. I know Andrew, I'm believing the best in Andrew. He's going to stay with me. He will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Do you love him today? Amen. Amen. Oh, something about him lights up the darkest place. Jesus the light of the world. The Lord is observing how, observing how we respond during the temptation or trial. When we say, I trust you, Lord, even when we can't see a way out, it pleases Him. Not only does it please Him, but it activates God's blessing. And He said, blessed is the man who endures temptation. Let me translate that for you. Who stays in faith. Who holds to my word. Blessed is that man. He's going to come out the other side victorious. Do you know why? Because God says, I'm going to see to it that he comes out or she comes out victorious. 
So you may be going through a tough time, as I said at the beginning, financially with your health, relationships, but the Lord can make a way for you if you will believe and not doubt. So let's continue rejoicing and praising God. The Bible says rejoice evermore. Huh? In everything give thanks. Not for everything, in every circumstance. Give thanks. Let's continue rejoicing, praising God, knowing we're blessed and we're coming out the other side to victory and promotion. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word today. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness to us, your people. Oh, you're a good, good father. And we thank you, Lord. We cling to the promise which says no weapon formed against us can prosper. For, Father, we have faith that you are greater than all. And we put our life in your hands. And forgive us, Lord, for areas where we've yielded to doubt and fear. We ask you to forgive us, Lord. Cleanse us. And we purpose in our hearts, Lord, to lock in to who you are. Uh, the Lord is saying this. Yes, uh, during this time, there's been many distractions. Distractions here, distractions there. Uh, the news media saying this, and distractions there. And it has caused many to take their eyes off of me, for I am the same. I have never changed. Don't be deceived by this trick of the enemy. Keep your eyes on me. Keep your eyes on my word. And you will see that I am faithful to perform my word. And you will come out of the test with a testimony that will bring glory to me and you'll have something to share with others. I've already made a way for you. I've already designed your way out. You can't see it, but I planned it. I designed it before the foundation of the world. So no that I have a plan. Know that I have a way out. Know that my ways are not your ways or man's ways, but they're greater than man's ways. Mm. And I will see to my church in all environments and through all seasons, saith the Spirit of grace. Amen. Amen. Just receive that this morning. The Holy Spirit's our comforter. Lord, we receive you comforting us, helping us, strengthening us this morning. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, breathe on us. I just sense now a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. Father, fill us afresh with your spirit. Now just receive that right. Even just from your seat, just put your hands out and just receive that. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Receive a fresh anointing. Joy. Peace. Peace which surpasses understanding. Oh, some of you have been carrying heavy loads, many cares. Give them over to the Lord. Lord, we give you our heavy burdens. We give you those cares. We give you those worries. We can't do anything about them, but we put them in your hands. And you can. Oh, amen. There it is. There's just God's peace just sweeping over this place. Thank you, Lord. He's so good. Oh. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. Praise 
Gill. I'm going to hand it back over. Amen.